All right, it's Cigar Saturday here on bourbonblog.com live. It's uh, really a pleasure for uh, Maddie Rock and I to uh, introduce our special guest tonight. Uh, joining us from Nashville, Tennessee, it's Jesse Cove and Martin Cove. What's up, guys? Much love, guys. Appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. We got our cigars ready for you. What are we smoking, Dad? We're smoking um, Romeo and Juliet at Short Churchill's. Mm. See, they can't prepare. They're not playing games. They, they, <laughs> they have it. Uh, they have the cigars. Maddie, what do we have? Got a little uh, little SP-1014 action from our, our brother, Sanj. So you got a, a Dominican Puro. So uh, four, five, and six-year-age tobaccos in there from our, our brother, Sanj. There's some in, uh, in your guy's bag, Martin and Jesse. So when that makes it there, you'll be able to enjoy that. And as we know, I'm a Lancero guy, all about the construction in these. So incredibly pleased with the smoke really good job you, brother you talk about you talk about construction of a cigar you know who sent me a half a dozen cigars kevin malone oh you know the, the mailman great yep. basketball player. so he sent me his cigars and their torpedoes and they're really delicious you know the dominicans and they're delicious and i i just you know i i smoked one because it depends on your mood if you want to sit and Watch 1883, we get something a little longer. And, you know, and his was just delicious. It was a torpedo. And, you know, there's a wrapper on there, Kevin Malone. And I gave it to someone who was a ma major basketball freak. And they loved it. They just loved it. I was so happy they liked the cigar, you know, because everybody loves Kevin Malone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so excellent. Anyway. But and we, we just came back. We just saw... Um, I just saw the uh, Karate Kid musical. Oh, it, uh, it, it premiered in St. Louis. Yeah, it'll go eventually to Broadway, and um, I'm so happy because it was so good. And the guy who steals the show is the guy who plays my character. It's a great Afro-American character named Alan Green, great actor, and all the Cobra Kai scenes are all in bright red light, and they're all the Cobra Kai are in they're in gold and black yees. And like all the Cobra Kai scenes steal the show because, you know, villainy on Broadway is always, you know, whether it's the Phantom or whether it's, you know, Dr. Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes, they're always presented with such glitz, you know, especially in a play, especially on a big stage, in, you know, in New York. It's great. It was great to see. And it'll make it. It'd be so Broadway. cool for you to actually see that and sit back and, and take it in and enjoy it, knowing that without what you've done, that would never have taken place. That's got to be a hoot, yeah. man. It's interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. what Robert, Robert came in, the writer who was there. You know, he said his dream was to have Ralph. Ralph went this weekend, and um, Billy saw it last weekend. And um, he says his dream was to open up this, years ago, is to open Karate Kid as a play on Broadway, and the three of us get out of a limo, and we join him, like in that show, The Offer, you know? And then when they're getting when they're getting their, you know, Academy, well, they ultimately got the Academy Award, when they're getting, you know, the accolades as they pull up to the theater on the night Godfather is opening, you know? I, I just saw that, and I saw the play. Yeah, it was all the same feelings, you know? And yet Karate Kid opened 35 years ago to the theaters, now it's opening up. It will be on Broadway within the year, and it'll be full circle. You know, movie, TV, play. I yeah. got to make sure to catch that live on Broadway. Yeah, and that sure. now is is St. Louis the only place we can see that now? It closes this week, and uh, it's been yeah. there for a month to work out the kinks. Right. And I don't know the schedule. I'm sure you can Google it and right. find it's out. Getting, it's getting rave reviews, so it's going to definitely. It's, it's definitely really go to really good. I mean, right. the hardest thing I think anybody to do, we all can see a successful play and make a movie of it, like Streetcar, like sure. you know, in, any number of things, you know, um, that we can go right with that story. We can go from the play. Boom. We make a movie of it. But to me, the greatest the greatest accomplishment was that he transitioned the appropriate scenes from the movie now onto the stage. That's harder. You know, because a movie, we got millions and millions of dollars to do whatever the hell we want. But on stage, you don't have that kind of budget. 
and you got to keep the audience involved. You can't, it can't be a visual special effect that keeps them involved. You got to keep them involved with character, you know, with plot. That's it. And, and the music, of course. Right. And um, th th he does. Robert Kamen does a wonderful job of, uh, you know, of accomplishing that for the stage. It really does. Yeah. And and they're doing the moves as they sing too, right? Yeah. yeah. They're all, all the moves, wow. all the stuff. And the nice. music is, is terrific. They got they got they were working on this for six years, you wow. know, working it in like you do with hair, you know, working it in different workshops, going to discos, going to all the places. I know when I was acting in New York, you know, you, you work things out at Cafe La Mama, you go off off Broadway, work stuff out. Then you go to off Broadway, then you go workshop it again. Then you take it to Philly, Boston, St. Louis. Then bam, you're ready for New York. You know. Yeah. By the way, speaking of these cigars, you should tell them when we first tried these cigars and how we became obsessed with these. The they sent us about. Well, no, no, before that. Remember? <laughs> oh yeah. So we were in Havana, and um, we had just taken the tour of of the Particus factory and which was unbelievable but just to be in the Particus factory in Cuba was like I mean we felt he turned into a little child when we went in there it was like it was like a kid on Christmas it was like I mean there was I've never seen so many cigars in my life I mean we're talking like millions of cigars it was just I mean you walk into a room and you see a hundred thousand cigars just sitting there on a in a room I mean it was just and then we saw them actually, the, we saw them rolling the tobacco actually from the leaves, you know, stretching them out and everything. I mean, it was, it was a educational, but also just, it was incredible. And, and they said, you, you can't film anything. You can't film anything with people doing it. It was just a factory law. But the tour guide, who was so cool, he, he, he was a big fan. He says, give me a camera. He gave it to an employee and he told the employee to walk around and take photos inside. We take videos of photos inside the factory room. And it was such an education. They were so nice. So we go downstairs after all this, and the head of publicity comes up. It's a gorgeous Cuban woman. Gorgeous. And she comes up with a three box, three cigars in a box. She says, we just got this contract. You smoke these. And it was a Romeo and Juliet, a Y. It wasn't a Y Churchill. It was just the Churchill. Same cigar, this is a little shorter. And he said, just try these. These will be the cigars of your life. And, and we smoked them, went to the Hotel Central, sat on the roof and just smoked them overlooking Cuba and all the funny looking cabs that are in pastel colors with white leather interior. It was just a-, a, a Do you have that picture here? I do have the picture. Where is it? It's hanging uh, over the bookcase. I'm gonna go get it. In my you guys room. are like this. Oh, it feel, feels it feels like that Ernest Hemingway moment, right? You yeah. felt like Hemingway for a little bit. It was, it was. And we went to the Hemingway house, you know? We did the Hemingway right. house, you know what I mean? And then we ended up in the Hotel Central on the roof. The guy's bringing us coffee and we say, let's try these cigars. So we try them and they're brilliant. Just brilliant mix of flavor, quality, and not getting you buzzed, you know, just easy. It's the kind of reason why we smoke cigars. So we can read, we can sit in the back, we can do nothing, look out on the property, you know? So we created this photograph. Oh, wow. Oh, how cool is that? That, that is great. Cool. Yeah, that's us sitting on top of the hotel and just, I mean, enjoying these. That's the first time we smoked these church, uh, the, the, the Churchill Wides for the first time. That's cool. That's and, very cool. And it just it just became our favorite cigar, you know, and your favorite. And uh, Martin, when you think back, I mean, I know you've been a cigar fan for a while. What was? Do you remember your first cigar and who it was with? Oh, of course. Do we make remember the first time we were with a girl? Jesus, <laughs> was it the same story or? You know, <laughs> it was oddly enough. I was in Vancouver and I heard stories about Cubans. Yep. But backing up a little bit, my first cigar years ago was a Royal Jamaican. And it was yeah. a little shop on Sunset. And I used to go there. And they were light cigars, but they were very flavorful. And they were Royal Jamaican cigars. I smoked them for several years. And someone talked about Cubans. And I, uh, I did a movie in Vancouver. I don't know. 
in the 90s sometime or the 80s. And um, I went to a cigar shop and I tried Hoyo de Monterey, Epicure, Hoyo de Monterey. You know, they were didn't even have a label on them. They were in a square box and they were light, very light. But that's what I needed. Something so smooth and rich, rich, you know, not with a bite. And then you got wonder, what am I doing? But this was silk. And you can read your script, read a novel. You can just listen to music. You can do everything. And it was heavenly. And that's why, you know, the, the earth in Cuba is different than every place else. I think it's lithium there. And you, when you take a Cuban seed and you, you bring it to another country, it's not as good because the earth is what makes the difference, you know? Yep. And especially in the 90s, right? How many times did we hear about people telling to try my cigar because it had Cuban seed Peloto in it, right? And then you're looking at the cigar, you're like, no, I, I, I don't think so, guys. But exactly that. That was when that whole cigar world exploded. And, yep. it, every, and there was a cigar lounge every other block, you know? I like smoking the Trinidad's as well. That's a that's a great yeah. cigar. The, uh, oh, yeah. the long, um, you know, the yeah. long thin ones. Those are Cohibas. Yeah, right? the Pantellas. If they're really long, you got the A's. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. like those a lot. Yeah. We also smoke uh, long a little while ago. We'll get back to it. But the Partagas Solomons, <laughs> huge cigars. <laughs> well, huge cigars. I, I I remember giving Nick Cage a box of those. You know, that was right we, at the Beverly we, Hills Hotel. We sat there forever. With that cigar it was such a long smoke i think we talked about every movie ever made you know you finished reading like three scripts yeah yeah those those all <laughs> you sit there and you know it tape it goes wider and then it goes now you think you're gonna be over soon it's another half hour by the way i have to thank you guys for um sending these to us oh uh, they're just so wonderful. wonderful i can't wait to try them uh my dad doesn't drink but uh he'll definitely have a sniff of these um, and I'll tell them how great they are. Oh, I love I, I'm one of those guys who loves smelling alcohol. I love really smoky tastes. I don't drink it, but I really, you know, I really enjoy what a guy. I just love like these these other things. They the the, the they said this is <sighs> which one? This. Yeah, yeah, the, the buzzards roost. The buzzards yeah. roost just alone. I mean, just to, I, there we go. Just to, it's really different. It's really different. It has all these flavors, you know. Now it's, the one that you may have there, Martin. We sent both the uh, the hard truth from Indiana. That's from uh, Nashville, Indiana. Uh, the rye whiskey and the smoked barrel. That buzzard's roost is one down out of Kentucky, and I think one of the ones you guys have there is the uh, cigar rye. Yeah, that's this one right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah they actually cigar use- Cigar rye, yeah, right yeah. here. Yeah, they what, use what? real Kentucky tobacco and they cold smoke the rye with the propri proprietary process. They don't, but they actually, they don't tell us how they do it, but they're able to influence through the barrel and the tobacco, the actual tobacco onto that rye, it's beautiful. Really so I don't beautiful. ever do this, I don't ever drink publicly like this but i will try this because this is a very special moment I'm, all right we appreciate it thank you. And, there you go. and he put the bottles thank you for that jesse we got the bottles behind us cheers stuff. all right cheers oh guys. do i love that smell it's, it's good delicious. cheers jesse well, really nice. salu i will live vicariously Martin. through you guys yeah cheers, cheers. Guys. thanks for having a sip, sip of that i think you're going to love the taste of this with the cigar i just i love the pairings the way the flavors can help I mean, elevate. it's almost like it's almost like syrupy it's like, syrupy. It's like really yeah very strong. Guys, so beautiful. Yeah, smooth. Very smooth. Yeah. We love smooth. We love it the bearings. I should probably ask Jesse that, that same question. First cigar, was it was it with your dad there? Or what was your first cigar, Jesse? Yeah. I mean, it was, um, I think it was, I'm trying to remember. I must have been probably, so we, we do, my dad and I do, um, we're part of a, a group called the Hole in the Wall Gang. Uh, and we go on horseback every year in Wyoming where Butch Cassie and the Sundance Kid used to ride and hang out. And these guys have been doing this since the 70s. My dad came in the mid-70s. No, mid-80s. Mid-80s. And it's a group of like 50 guys. Um, and we basically ride horses for like five days. We camp out, you know, play music, campfire. We have food that's cooked for us. Um, it's really a, a special experience. You're off the grid. It's just really nice and relaxing. 
and you know they carry out the Western traditions and things like that. Cigars, all vintage, all vintage. Cow- vintage. Nobody wears baseball caps and stuff. Yeah, they all. Everybody's in vintage cowboy gear, and it's a celebration of the American heritage. Yeah, and there's there's Jews up there. There's Christians. I mean, everybody who loves the West is up there, um, and uh, it's really just it's a great experience. I think I and you're allowed to go when you're 18. And I think I, I think I had my first cigar probably up there with you guys. Yeah, I think so. I was allowed to go when I was 18. He let me have a cigar up there, and I had a cigar in the real like old fashioned out in the West. You know, it was really it was a cool experience, and um, you know, I, I'll never forget that. And I, I think you know, obviously, I. I Definitely enjoy having a, a great cigar with my dad every now and then, and friends back home. Um, and um, funny enough, uh, um, Weston Cage Coppola, who's uh, Nicholas's son, uh, he's a dear friend of mine. He and I love to smoke cigars together. I should actually have him come on with you guys. He'll, he'll love to chat with you. Nice. Um, he's a terrific actor. And uh, yeah, so you know, having a cigar is always a, we we'll sit in the jacuzzi here and have cigars at night you know, and uh, just enjoy ourselves. It's just such a, it's just so relaxing and, and a nice, um, you know, tradition to do. I personally find when I would go to Aspen when I was skiing and I'd go to Aspen wherever I was, especially Aspen because people always, you know, they don't, they, they come and they ski every day and they got to get as much skiing in as they can. I don't. I go one day, I hang out in the jacuzzi and have a cigar if it's the second day. Then I go, maybe I'll go skiing the third day. But the highlight is to sit in the jacuzzi in Aspen in the snow with a cigar. That's good. It's a good introspective moment, right? That's what makes cigar smoking so amazing. So it's either something you do where you're socializing with with a bunch of your your friends or the next moment it could be you're just uh, reflective, sit back, chill out. Like you said, great probably to read over scripts or just uh, or just be able to chill out from a long day. So that's what makes it just so amazing. Because yeah. obviously you could use it either way, right? Great socialization tool or great when you're sitting back on your own and you just need to be reflective and introspective and just uh, chill out and enjoy the moment. Yeah. Some of the best conversations I've ever had in my life have been over cigars or just tobacco yeah. in general. I, I used to smoke cigarettes. I, you know, I don't like to say that too much, but I, I quit years ago. And you know, I've always some of the best conversations I've had were over cigarette breaks, either on set or with other people or musicians, artists or whatever, or, you know, obviously cigars. So definitely brings people together in a certain way. Not that I'm condoning smoking for anyone who's watching, but uh, <laughs> disclaimer, uh, it's at your own discretion. Well, and and we'll have to say, uh, you know, what a what a thrill it's been for all of us, uh, like Maddie and I, and I know so many of those watching, uh, when, when Cobra Kai uh, came back, uh, season one, of co- course, uh, Jesse uh, in that as well, but that that moment right at the end uh, when uh, Sensei John Kreese appears and you appear actually with a, a cigar. That was that was the that was the uh, that was the moment. The moment that was the moment. Was, the moment. Uh, was that something that they just said, "Hey, we, you should do this"? Did you say, "I want to appear with the cigar"? Tell tell us about that. You know, I, I wrestle with that moment a lot because. Um, it often says what you you do panels and they often ask you what's your favorite scene. And my favorite scenes really are that the entrance pretty much. And, and I guess season three going through the window with my scene, my favorite scenes are with Billy mostly because right. there's such history between Johnny Lawrence and John Kreese. We don't even have to act. We just, you look at each other and everybody reads 35 years of, of karate kid movies into every moment of Cobra Kai even, even uh, not to interrupt, thing, we interviewed, we have our own podcast, um, Kicking It With The Coves, which we could talk about there. But we had Ralph on, uh, and even Ralph had mentioned about how when he watches uh, my dad and Billy Zapka, who plays Johnny Lawrence, when he watches the two of them together, it's, it's so fascinating for him to even watch them because there's such, you know, father-son dynamic and just the history of them. And so it, it's nice to, to see that as well. It's just the truth. And, and that scene holds such richness you know was the cigar they knew i smoked cigars and the three writers are great guys they're like 42 years old star wars fans but they're karate kid fans they saw the movie when they were six you know and they've been fans so they write so well and that's what makes the show so good but that one line you know the real story is only just begun the real story (laughs) 
And I, when I say that line, I've got the cigar and I exhale. And I look at that scene. It all, you know, that whole, it's so much easier for an actor to be able to emote stuff that comes easily to the tongue. You know, we've all guest starred on stuff in the 70s. And it was, you know, these, they used to crank out all those shows. And, and a lot of it was tough to do. You know, the written word isn't there. You can't just fly with it, you know. Cobra Kai, all the written words are there. And you're able to fly with it. So when I came in and I had the cigar, they gave, you know, the scene was written with a cigar because the writers know I smoked. And I did request it. And they gave me these cigars that were inexpensive cigars, the prop guy. And I was getting a headache. So I had Cubans of my own and I brought them because I've been in this position before where you get prop cigars and you're dying. You know, just you get you dizzy. You can't cardboard remember. Cardboard cigars. Cardboard. It's like smoking, you know, it's just like smoking corrugated paper, you know. <laughs> and and so I I hated it. But, you know, the reason why I don't use my cigars is because you got to cut up the Cubans and make them the same size as the continuity. So if you got half a cigar, you start to see with half the cigar, you got to cut up five cigars because you're going to do 10 takes. And you got to cut up, you know, $30, $40 cigars. And I hated doing that, you know? <laughs> Smoke them two puffs, cut, new cigar. And then you got a whole, you got 12 cigars that have been puffed twice, you know? So now we know what your new film writer is going to say for anything that you work on. <laughs> hey, I need about 15 boxes of Cubans or this really isn't like going to be right. Good ones. Well, it does get that way because as the season progressed, I insisted on the better cigars, you know, and um, I got them. But what's interesting is that, that when I did it, I did it with a Cuban cigar. It was a little smoother. It was a little easier. And um, I mean, there are good Dominicans out there. There's no question about it. But for my palate at that moment, there's so much tension to get because remember this guy's coming in and when i came in and i hit my mark and i said my line in the first rehearsal i heard from video village on the other side of the dojo 10 15 people watching the monitors and all of a sudden i hear a right after i said the line i hear a oh it was like they finally got the sensei to say their first line you know and they were waiting for this for the whole season because it was episode 10 and I couldn't, I couldn't even appear. I had to hide in my room that week because they were shooting the All Valley Tournament and they couldn't have any extra see that John Kreese was coming in, you know? And it was, it was very exciting. It was extremely exciting. And um, we owe it all to the writers. I've said a thousand times, you know, came and wrote a great script. And I, I said it to Ralph and, you know, all the time I said, came in with feel that the, that, that Robert came in the writer would feel that it was the chemistry of Yagi and Ralph that made the success of the movie. I don't. I feel, as I do it for every movie, that it writes words that we say over the years, over and over again. The Force Be With You, Frankly Scarlet, I Don't Give a Damn, From Gone with the Wind, Casablanca, Play It Again, Sam, you know? You hear all these great, great lines, you know, Adrian, you know, I mean, these are, these come from great movies that were written well in total. Yeah. So the it's been immortalized. Line, that, that's when you know great. something's amazing. It's been literally immortalized. Yep. Literally yeah. immortalized. That's a very good phrase. Literally immortalized. And um, I feel that way about the Karate Kid. His words are the star. Not Marty Cove, not Ralph. Ma and Ralph kind of, you know, agrees with me because we talked about it last week on the podcast. So it, it's a, been a very exciting run. It's a 40-year phenomenon and season five airs September 9th and you know, on Netflix and it's very exciting. There's so many surprises, so many exciting things. I'm really sorry I can't talk about it much but it's really brilliant and the world is just waiting for it, you know? Yeah, it, it, it's uh of course, I'm sure there's people watching right now that are going to be curious about what happens in season five. And I mean, we should probably go ahead and say, if you're watching this, we may mention some things that would be spoiler alerts for the ones that are already out there. Of course, we leave you in season four um, with uh, with kind of some bad news, right, uh, Mark? Well, he goes to jail. 
that, goes to you go to jail. Goes to jail, but I can. That's know. it. I, I, yeah, obviously yeah. he's in handcuffs. He's, 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 he's going. In handcuffs. Down. He's going downtown for a while. I feel we should have put a bit. I feel we should have put in a disclaimer, Tom, before before people. Here's a, I'll give you one. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe I'll put before when I put the post. I'm like, okay. here's a disclaimer, right? Well, you're, yeah. No, no, no. We no. we will see we will see you though again, right, Martin? You're not just going to be in behind bars. I'm, we will be no, seeing no, no. you in this one. Nothing. No. Would John Kreese ever just be in bars? I don't think so. <laughs> no. You know, <laughs> Come on, Tom. It was, it was shameful that you asked that, Tom. We'll have to talk later. No, no. We <laughs> know we're going to see him again. He's on a dinghy boat in the ocean. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like putting John Gotti in jail, you know? Yeah. Mm -mm. As a New York guy, nope. <laughs> you got to remember, like in the opera, they say, you know, these the, the sauce is so important to cook. These guys have a family dinner, and then they go out and they and they cap people, you know? But the sauce of the meal prior to them going out and doing business is very important. And from what I understand on the uh, the Karate Kids, the original Karate Kids, uh, you all would train separately, the Cobra Kai uh, versus the Miyagi. Uh, you were training separately, then you would come together. Obviously, there was, there was good chemistry, but you would be training separately, even off screen. Was that the case for the Cobra Kai series as well? Well, it, it's a little different because the kids get a little less time than we do. Right. Billy, Billy, and, Billy Ralph and I get a little more time to work things out. That fight, say, in season one, because we didn't really do, we just did it on the periphery. We rehearsed it a little, not much, because I was only up there for a week. When we started season two, and, and the whole big sell was, and you'll love this, on the podcast, we talk about this because we did the writers, and it's a great podcast to listen to that where the writers came on the show. They were quite apprehensive to sit me down in Dan Tanner's and have an offer me the show because I was coming in on episode 10, episode 10 only. And I would say, well, why can't I come in episode five and six? And they would say, well, you're going to really be setting up season two. Your appearance will set up season two, and then you'll be in every episode. They were afraid based on my character in Karate Kid 1, that I was the asshole, the tough guy that was going to wring their neck because they only wanted me in one episode of season uh, one. And they were afraid that I'd get angry at the table and possibly do something physical. <laughs> they, I swore, word of honor. I never knew this till I did the podcast. He's a sweetheart. <laughs> I, I cried supermarket openings. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so... It's really interesting for me to, to see now all the people come back after season four and they come to an autograph show. I chat with them anywhere in Publix or wherever. And they all say, you know, we're really getting to like your character because your character is transitional. We see what made him the way he was. And he's not all bad like we thought he was, you know. And that to me showed us so much perception because I only signed on if this show, this TV show could work texture into the character, give him a little vulnerability. And it, the public is seeing that now, which is very exciting for me, the actor, you know? Oh yeah, it adds, it adds a whole lot new layer of depth to it, right? So that makes things even, even cooler. It brings in the audiences even more, so absolutely. And Jesse, when Jesse did his show, I mean, we, we talked about it yesterday. We had the stuntman, Ken uh, Bearfield, on the podcast yesterday. And um, we talked all about, uh, tell them, because yeah. Ken was the other guy in the scene with him. That's his friend. They both get out of the car and they go in and they get their asses kicked in the back by the young crease, you know, and it was, it's just wonderful. Yeah, it was really fun. I mean, obviously, like we, we talked about, like there's so much fighting that happens in Cobra Kai and stuff. And we chatted about that. Ken, Ken had this great story he talks about because in the diner sequence ken is also my dad's stunt double on cobra kai so in the diner sequence which is a flashback scene with young crease i play the bully who you know bullies young crease and um and uh it was uh it was just so much fun i mean there was so much going on and uh it was the story he said was he is crease's stunt double looking at young crease who's then going to fight young crease 
while Kreese is watching all of us and with Kreese's son, all of this. So it's like this multiverse of craziness going on. And it was really cool. I mean, we had such a blast doing that, that whole segment. It was just so much fun. And for him to watch was just great. And, uh, you know, we definitely had cigars afterwards uh, that day, which was, which was awesome. And, you know, it's been, it's been a great experience. And it's been really fun to see people, you know, just enjoy this, the show so much. And, you know, they just did a, in LA, they did uh, Cobra Kai Live, which was, they had all, most of the cast in, in, at the Microsoft Theater. I mean, there must have been a thousand people there in person. Oh, it's more. It's like 35, 4,000 people there. They filled the whole place. And they did interviews and they did a couple live stunts on stage. And it was just so cool to see the fandom of, you know, the Cobra Kai universes, whether they're Miyagi Do fans, Eagle Fang fans, Cobra Kai fans. It was just, it was, it's like a Marvel super. Uh, Avengers universe. It's amazing. Yeah, and I, I'll go ahead and put it up here since you all just mentioned it. The name of the podcast you all do is called Kicking It with the Coves. Yes, that's uh, right. On Spotify or on Apple. Yep. Nice. And Check leave it. reviews if you like it. But yeah. It, it's really, we have had, you can, they can go back and, and, and look up the old. We've had Chris Jericho on. We've had yes. a lot of, the, most of the cast from the show on, the writers. Uh, Ralph's coming on. Uh, we are going to interview uh, Johnny Lawrence soon. A lot of Peyton List, Jacob Bertrand, Joe Co. Uh, a lot of the different cast members. It's been, it's just been. And my sister is on the show with us, uh, which is fantastic. And you, you just love it. It's a great sit down, very much like this. And we, you know, it's it's a family show as well. So it's kind of cool to talk about all this stuff as a family. Kick it, kicking it with the Coves. Uh, right. I can imagine uh, guys just having all these. All these original characters from the uh, original Karate Kid uh, franchise back together. I mean, doing doing this continuing story. What's that? What's that been like? Just personally. Uh, just well, I, I think oh. the Okinawa situation. When I watch the Okinawa stuff, which is season four, four, yeah, season four, it was so touching. Especially the girl who played his love interest when they sit down at the table and just Ralph and, and her. And I wasn't even involved in that. One of the writers, Hayden Schlossberg, he went to, to um, they went to Japan and did all those scenes. And um, when I watched it the first time, it was so soft and gentle and wonderful. It was so meaningful. And then, you know, when, when he gets involved with, everybody's older now. So you, you're looking at their faces and they all, they all maintain their character so well. You know, and the last time we looked at Karate Kid 2, I don't know. I mean, it's been a long time. And uh, you, all these characters were rich in Karate Kid 2 because, it, you know, they went to Hawaii to shoot it, but it was based, based in Okinawa. And um, it, it, it really, that, that group that was in, I would say, Karate Kid 2 moved me the most in Cobra Kai. And they're going to be... And on, and you'll see when you guys watch uh, upcoming episodes. But I, I truly enjoy the kids the most. When they ask me, what character would you like to be out of all the characters? They always ask that in panels, aside from John Kreese. And you know what I say? I, I say usually Hawk or Tori. Yeah. You know, and Tori mostly. Because a female warrior like Sandal Bergman in Conan, you know, I mean, you know, whether it's Wonder Woman or whether it's something else in there, the Amazons that were in Wonder Woman, there's something marvelous or a great female tennis player, you know, I mean, the way they backhand, the way they hit, it is just, it's just a pleasure to watch that. Yeah. Because it's the strength of a guy where women weren't allowed to be that strong over the you know, the last few decades. Now, all of a sudden, we see that wonderful competition. And I think it's terrific. I, you know, I think it's just terrific. And I'm bringing that level into Cobra Kai and having the female warriors there being very serious, as serious as I am, which is why Martin Cove and John Kreese is attracted to that kind of disposition, you know? I, I can tell the kids have some truly have some real talent and some real passion for this. They don't get rehearsal time, man. Yeah. They get two, three days. That fight scene in the school that we talked about it yesterday, the fight scene in the house, Ralph's house, 
these kids get two days. I mean, we get two months because we're old, <laughs> so, you know, so we got to perfect this, you know, and um, we all try to do our own stunts anyway. Uh, but going through a window, I, I, I let the stunt guy do that. But, you know, I mean, the kids are great athletes. They're doing, you know, wonderfully. And uh, and they're good. They're good martial artists. And they weren't, weren't all really, Tori didn't know anything about martial art. You know, Peyton, she wasn't a martial artist. And she's developed into this wonderful warrior. So some of them had had, had, had training, but some of them never yeah. until they came on. Yeah. Well, Billy was just in, a wrestler. He didn't have training. And to get back to your original question, training us separately created the mystique. Training Cobra Kai separate, Miyagi and Ralph separate, and me separate. Three hours a day we worked out. And Pat Johnson, who was our stunt coordinator, who was the referee in all the the red shirt with the black mustache, he was the referee in Karate Kid 1 and 2. And, you know, he was... He was our stunt coordinator, and he ran with Chuck Norris in the 60s and 70s in the tournament scene worldwide. So he was the partner. Bruce Lee loved that guy's work. His name is Pat Johnson, and wanted him to play a villain with Chuck in all of his movies. And they didn't really want to do that. But they were just great fighters, softest spoken guys, including Chuck. Because I did a two-hour walk with Texas Rangers, and... Nicest guy. He had twins when I had these kids. And he was just the sweetest guy. But these guys get on the wrong side of them. It's over. <laughs> bye bye. You know. <laughs> All right. Tell us, Tay. Tell us uh, for everybody watching down below what maybe one of your favorite scenes from Karate Kid or uh, Cobra Kai. Uh, you're watching uh, Bourbon Blog Cigar mm -hmm. Saturday Live and. Uh, you know, we should probably mention um, there's someone else. Maddie, you did a little fighting or some sort of martial art back in the day, didn't you, Maddie? I, I did Muay Thai for about uh, 15 years. Uh, Muay Thai. I decided oh. that I, I started bruising like a peach at a, at a certain age. It became training and promoting uh, some of the sport. And uh, I just love it, man, because um, it teaches you a certain respect for these martial arts, how it's done, the fluidity of movement. Um, it's a cliche thing to say, but it's really how spiritually involved, you know, right? Some of the best fighters on the planet, you take a Bruce Lee about how spiritually involved in the martial art you have to be that actually takes you uh, to that next level. I like Muay Thai because uh, a lot of the ferocity of the sport, you know, knees, elbows, shins, um, you know, you talk about a martial art that really is is, is put together as, as, as combat, you know? you know, a total combat martial art. So, you know, I love that. And then obviously I'm a little bit older. So then you watched uh, Evolution go on and then you watch all these MMA guys and you're like, OK, these guys have their ground game, their Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, their strikers, they have karate, they have twi uh, Taekwondo. Um, and it just goes to show you just how much goes into the art and for you guys to to sit back, not just as actors, but to bring this into the fold, too. And it becomes part of not just who you are anymore, the role uh, Martin Jesse, I, I have to say, it probably becomes part of your personality, too, because it takes a mental toughness to go through all the training and everything else. So that's probably, you know, that's one of probably the added pluses of, of doing roles like that, because that adds to who you are as a person. Yes. Well, unquestionably, yep. you know, it often comes up. It, it, it comes up as positive or as destructive at times. You, you, a lot of John Kreese, because last year we did two seasons. And so I'm six months in this guy. Even though I broke it up with Dancing with the Stars, I was six months in this guy. And it's rough. You're six months in a character, and he's a vindictive guy at times. And then there are times when he cares about Billy and, and, and all that emotion comes up and all. But in, in my relationship with a woman, I tell you, it's gotten in the way because you just, it's John Kreese's way or it's no way or it's the highway. And that's gotten in the way of being more sensitive and patient in relationships. And I caught it, you know, I caught it. And I, I worked on being more patient. I worked on in the off season, I worked on being more tolerant in situations where, um, you know, John Kreese just became embedded in me and I had to release it. 
I had to get rid of it. And um, I was a lot happier. But the discipline, the positive part, the discipline of being able to analyze why your way is better than their way, why they made a mistake at the airline. You really made a mistake. I'm not sitting there. I'm sitting over here with my girl. And that's wrong. And you just hold it. And you hold that stare. And you hold that John Kreese intention, intensity. Excuse me. You made a mistake. Why don't you just look at the paper again? It's real. And they make a mistake. And the mere fact, so that kind of discipline of believing in yourself and believing in who you are, that you are right, works. Take it a little too far. You got to readjust. So that's why, you know, John Kreese, always approach karate as an offensive sport while Miyagi approached it as a defensive art. And that's where Cobra Kai versus Miyagi do, you know, boom. They don't meet. Which is beautiful, right? That makes, yeah. that's, that's what makes it so amazing. Cause that, that conflict is what creates everything, right? Your spirituality over your ferocity or vice versa. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, right now that 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 yin yet, then that's what the world's about, right? Yin yang. So that's what I think. That's why everybody now. I mean, it's it's being a cultural icon to do something to you know three and a half decades later, and to still enthrall people the the same way. I mean, I don't know if 30, 35 years ago you thought it would be mainstream of of, of pop culture, and it is mainstream of pop not culture a, every day. I mean, not, amazing. My, my wife at the time. I was doing a picture in Eugene, Oregon. I'll never forget this. I get on the phone and your mother, she just saw Karate Kid at, at the theater on Hollywood Boulevard. I think it was the Man's Chinese Theater. And she saw it and I said, cause I never went to the premiere. And I said, how was it? And she says, oh, the movie was great. The movie was great. I said, how was I? And she says, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, I took a long pause on the phone and I, I didn't want to make it egotistical, but I said, I was just okay. And you know, the guy is one dimensional, but somehow people enjoyed, they didn't know whether to hate to love him or love to hate him, you know? And you, you migrate. Cause I look back at that movie and I, I look at it with Jesse and we say, he never smiles. He just doesn't smile. His kids win ice. His kids not doing so well, ice. And it's just, you know, it's interesting. It's just really interesting. And until you get to Karate Kid 2, he's suffering and he loses his dojo. And then in Karate Kid 3, which was my vehicle, well, Sorry, it's just a picture, huh? which was my vehicle, and I couldn't do what they written had written for me to do, to sting for Mike Barnes and for Ralph. Uh, there wasn't a Terry Silver. It was all my vehicle. Right. And I got a TV series called Hard Time on Planet Earth completely uh, collided with schedules. And I remember having a conversation with Jeff Katzenberg and saying, can we start a little later on the series? It was Disney and CBS. And they said, no, you're the only star. You, we've got to, you got to do it. And I love you in those movies. But so we brought in, they rewrote it and brought in a character called Terry Silver. So technically Terry Silver... Got that part. Thomas Ian Griffin did a great job. And then he got to come and play in Cobra Kai. Yeah. yeah. Which is a great element to bring in. Oh, yeah. Throw a wrench in the entire situation. Just, yeah, just bringing that in has, has changed things so much. As you, uh, Martin, as you talk about the uh, the balance between the, the Miyagi Do and the Cobra Kai, just to find that balance, uh, did Koala Kai help you find a, find a balance too? <laughs> Well, you know, Koala Kai was really interesting because I kept bugging them. I said, can't you find a name a little more macho than Koala? What were the names, were the names that they came up with? They kept through Kai. They can't remember all the, But they wanted something softer. And I said, oh, no, I dig it. I dig it. And I, I like I like what you, you know, we played with the script, my manager and I. And they were very open. QuickBooks was great. Very open. And the director was terrific. And I wanted to do that kind of thing. I like to show that there's another side of Martin Cove as the actor, you know? And um, Jesse and I, Jesse stars in a movie called A Taste um, a Taste for Love. And Jesse's romantic lead. And uh, we'll tell him about that. Because there was- well, We a, did. We, we were talking about it last time we did this. We're actually doing- Yeah, tell us, tell us. 
Yeah. Well, we're, we're doing ADR for it next week. Uh, it's a movie last time we spoke that I was shooting down in Dunedin, Florida, and it's just a beautiful movie about a girl who comes from Atlanta, goes to her hometown in um, in Dunedin, Florida, where the movie take movie takes place. And, you know, she kind of goes back to her roots and she ends up seeing me again, her old flame. And, you know, we kind of have a rough start and, uh, you know, and then we kind of rekindle our love and it gets pushed and pulled apart. And I don't want to give too much away, but it's just a lovely story. It surrounds family and food. And my dad plays her father in the movie. And it's just a wonderful story. Aaron Cahill plays uh, the lead, the female lead. She's just incredible. And uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful story. A good friend of ours, Lincoln Loggison, is producer. And we shot in Dunedin, which was such a wonderful, wonderful town. It's probably one of the funnest movies we've ever done because of shooting it in, in Dunedin, Florida. It was just so magical. And no edge. My character had no edge. He was a restaurateur who inherits this restaurant from his mother. And it was so soft. And I loved it. And, you know, I, I, you know, I brought, I mean, the nicest thing for me was I brought tears to all the crew member while doing this one scene about my mother leaving this restaurant to me. And it's a scene with Aaron. And it was just stuff I don't get a chance to do on Cobra Kai, you know, except being in jail, which you can't go into. You know? <laughs> it's, um, it's really fun to go back and forth and do those characters. And uh, I enjoy that very much. I really do. And watching Jesse play the, you know, every act, every heavy wants to be a leading man. Every leading man wants to be a heavy. And, you know, watching my son do the kind of role that I would like to do, the romantic lead, walking the beach with a beautiful woman, taking her in his arms and kissing her. I said, shit, I've been doing this for 50 years. I've had one opportunity to do that, you know? And, I, and it was a movie called White Light, you know? And bottom line was, it, it was such a pleasure to do this and to see my son do these Clark Gable roles. I mean, I, I just, you know, to me, it's worth its weight in gold. It doesn't matter how much money they're paying you. You know, it's, oh, just, thanks, Dad. it's just great, you know? <laughs> That's cool. And so when is that going to be coming out soon, Jesse? Is that? Uh... Yeah, they're working on a, a deal right now. Uh, we're finishing up some post-production stuff on it. So you'll see it probably within the next, uh, you'll probably see in early uh, 2023. Nice, nice. So we be, and again, tell love. us the name of it. Uh, a Taste of Love. A Taste of Love with uh, Jesse Cove. What other projects are you uh, working on, Jesse? Well, the one I've been talking about recently, which I'm most excited about, one of the reasons I'm growing my hair out and everything, and, um, and I actually just shaved yesterday. Oh, uh, hair, hair game, bud. Maddie's working on it. Too. Oh, yeah, look at that. Uh, no, I just look like a dirty hippie, though. Jesse looks good. I look like somebody's going to throw a quarter in my cup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting for the boop. You don't say no, though. You know, I mean, getting you a quarter. No, no, a absolutely part, not. A quarter, yeah. quarter is a quarter, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm doing. I'm playing Wyatt Earp in a movie – that's a prequel to uh, Tombstone, and it's when Doc Holliday and Wider first met, um, and it's it's an incredible, incredible story, and uh, I'm very excited about it. I can't wait for people to see this. I uh, personally love this story, and um, <clears throat> I just can't wait for people to, to see, you know, me try and take on this role, which I'm very, very excited about. I, I do, I, I basically buy it up in real life. You know, I ride horses. I do shoot revolvers and all that stuff. So, I, you know, I'm going to try and bring an element to it that's uh, a little different than what we've seen before. So I'm excited. Wow. And that's going to be shooting soon. That'll be probably towards the end of the summer. And you're playing White Earp. Yep. Younger White Earp. Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, <laughs> so there's there's sort of a, something that it, it sort of continues. Martin, you did something in the White Earp that was in the 90s, didn't you? Yeah, you did. No, I did White Earp with Kevin Costner. I had yeah. a great time. Yeah, Very good so. time. You know, he's he's everything he does, he turns into a Western. Whether it's Waterworld, Postman, Tin Cup, he just turns it all into a Western. You know, and he's doing four two hours this summer, um, I think called Horizon, I think it's called. And um, you know, he's he's just he's just great to work for. I, I cried when I left the set. That's how much I love being part of that company. Larry Kasdan directing you, you know. He just, it doesn't get better than that. You know, it, it was a story. It was a story of the Earp trilogy. And it was originally created by Dan Gordon to be three, two hours on cable. And then Kasdan came in and it became a um, one movie about the Earp family. 
different than Tombstone, which was basically about Tombstone. You know, even though Tombstone is a classic, you know, just a classic movie. And same people, may rest in peace. John Fasano, one of the writers of Tombstone, had a hand in writing this script. And um, it's, I play, you know, I'm going to play this, the mayor who brings Wider from Wichita into Dodge City. And um, it's, it's just a couple of days, but it's really, I want to be part of it because it's a good Western. And we need a good Western right now. We need that moral fiber to give these kids a little hero. Yes. Kids don't have a goddamn hero, and we need one. Do you do you oh. see, do you foresee uh, each of you more more westerns in the future for uh, for films for TV shows? Do you see more of those old school coming back? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out now that's been really great. 1883 and Yellowstone. I think that's kind of kicked off a great uh, energy around westerns, and you know, we've got some stuff in the works that we're trying to put together right now. That that's getting a lot of interest, uh, you know, our own projects and and uh, I think it's you know every all actors love to do westerns. It's like the true nitty gritty of of you know like cinema is doing a western. You know, just getting getting out there, you know, in, in the in the wilderness and getting dirt on you and riding a horse and you got a revolver. It's kind of like it's like every you know even for women, it's like a, you know they just love it. It's such a great great time. You can also get in right that uh, that early Americana, something that we we were talking about before, to be able to get a win and uh, and share those stories, right? So and we're missing a, cigars. missing so much, right? Yeah. And some cigars and whiskey in there, yeah. That's that's what. But, uh, but it's got to be. See, the difference is Red River Searchers. You know, my favorite westerns are The Wild Bunch, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Red River, um, Butch Cassidy. You know, Tombstone and White Earp, but. Bottom line is today, because the kids are so hip and so sophisticated, if you don't create, let's just be perfectly honest, from 1920 to 1967, one of every, this is a statistic in Cowboys and Indians magazine, one of every three Western, one of every three movies in Hollywood from the 1920 to 1967 was a Western. So it's a highly overexposed genre. And to make it different, whether we do The Mandalorian or we do Star Wars, the bottom line is if you want to go back to 1883, you're going to have to write it as well as Taylor Sheridan. You're going to have to write it where we care so much about these characters. We cry in every episode of 1883. And if you want to do a full-length feature like that, you're going to have to love the characters. You're going to have to be different with your plot. And you're going to have to have all the elements that... Well, that I saw last night in Elvis, right? Otherwise, no one's going to go. And no one's going to... Then the sheep in Hollywood are not going to make 10 more Westerns because they need to have one that's super successful. And then everybody starts making a Western. Just how it goes, you know? Right. By the way, I have a whiskey question for you. Yes, please. What, what sweet mash rye is. Ah, I'm glad you asked. So that wonderful sweet mash, which I have... Uh, behind me here from Hard Truth. There's only a few distilleries that do this. Only like three, I think, in the whole country. Uh, sweet mash and sour mash. Most all bourbons and ryes are made uh, in a sour mash style, meaning they keep a little bit left over in that fermenter tank from that last run, uh, from that last recipe. With sweet mash, they actually clean out the tanks and they do it all new. And Hard Truth in Nashville... Indiana uh, is one of the ones that does this so well. Uh, this rye is just with with the elements of earth and spice and fruit, everything that comes through here. And this one's 116 proof. So this is some serious proof here right from the barrel. They do it really well. I think we probably will be seeing more uh, sweet mash uh, whiskeys done. It's a lot more expensive. It's a lot more uh, time consuming. But it's 116 really proof for a bourbon. Uh, is that higher than, than your normal... It is. It is. Usually they um, they proof it down to between 80s and 90s, but we're seeing so many more oh, just consumers that love the high proof and distilleries that love to put it out. I hear that they have a little deal. You get training wheels to put on either side of your legs after you after you drink it. Yeah, if you have enough proof. It's a great uh, idea, right? I, you sure. sent those along with these. I appreciate that. The little yeah, absolutely. No, they're great. And I tell you, I love bourbon pairings. 
um, with cigars, but I love rye. I mean, the way the spice of the rye brings out cigars that elevates the spice. Uh, the other one there that you'll try later, Jesse, is the double oak, and they put it in all types of barrels to really uh, accentuate the flavors of wow. the bourbon. So you're going to love the double oak. It's it's really kind of like a cigar in itself, but I'm doing mine on a little bit of rocks uh, today because of the heat and just letting it... Uh, Letting it open up, which I think I love works. It. Um, well, have you tried? Hold on. Have you tried? Um, the, the, we did a UFC watch party uh, yeah. a month ago. It was really, really fun. Mm. And, and um, um, what's his name? Jesus, how could I just forget his name? Uh, runs the UFC. Um, Dana White. Uh, yeah, Dana White sent us his Howler whiskey that he has. Have you tried that? I've heard about this. Haven't tried it. How did you like it? Uh, we haven't tried it yet either. So okay. I was just curious. We've, we've yeah. got it here. So I was just curious. But. Uh, definitely looking forward to these two. Uh, yeah, send much. us anything new because I educate people at my house. And, you know, we'll have a group here and we'll do the cigars. And it, it's sort of like, if you think about it, because we've been big fans of the offer, they drink bourbon. They're smoky this, smoky yeah. that. Bob Evans drinks. It's all the names that I'm not familiar with, you know? And um, because years ago when I drank, I, I would drink tequila mostly. But I remember... Buying tequila it was 1999. It was Chinaco tequila. Yes, the first, the first snifting tequila. And on the back of the label, they would say, "Pour into a snifter and just work it." You know. Yeah. And that's how I learned. Honest to God, that's how I learned to drink tequila because yeah. my parents were Jewish. All they had was Canadian Club and Crown Royal, and that's it. And I remember, you know, not, not to sound like one an alcoholic but every time i had a first date what i would do is i would take just to be more uninhibited i thought i would go take the canadian club and spill it into a shot glass and take it brush my teeth and then i was ready for my first date it only was on a first date you know? <laughs> I was 17 18 and you know and i felt more uninhibited and it, and it worked its way that way, you know? Yeah, tequila, tequila can often be good on a lot of first dates. I think it can really help uh, start a conversation going and can put people at ease. Chinaco is, uh, is good. I mean, it was uh, one of the first three that was 100% agave that came over to the U.S. in the 90s, and it's it's really a nice one. Is it still around, Chinaco? You can still find it, yeah. yeah. Much more expensive now. I remember Green yeah. Bats on Sunset Boulevard, 1999, and then now I, I looked at it a couple of years ago. It was 50 bucks, you know, yeah. and um, every, I mean, everything, you know, is going up, but the bottom line is um, it was the smoothest. Is it still sure. considered one of the smoothest amongst rock has a tequila Clooney has a tequila. Yeah. We like, we like those two. Uh, Chinaco uh, El Tesoro was another one. There was one of the original hundred percent agaves. Uh, we enjoyed some of the Patrons. There's some, there's quite a few that I really like. Casamigos, there's there's a number. And it's tequila really has, as far as growth, tequila and mezcal have both grown just in in just massive ways the last two and a half years. Yeah, mezcal has exploded. I never thought I yeah. would hear uh, med, the word mezcal and Negronis used as every third or fourth thing a <laughs> year. Like, I'll take a mezcal and Negroni. I was like, well, all right. Is it, isn't it, does it still have the worm on the bottle? In the Some of, of the them, bottom? there's one brand that does have it in the bottom, so... Jose wow. Cuervo, that used to be the Cuervo thing with the worm at the bottom. Yeah, I tell you, that I, that was a macho thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, who's drinking the worm? You're like, wait, I'm already three shots in. I got this. Yeah, exactly. We haven't talked about this, but we can say to you guys, yeah. Paul, we've got, he's got a drink coming out, um, in, uh, which is called Hard. I'll show you a picture of it. And we just posted about it the other day, but this is it here. Oh, very, wow. very cool. What's it uh, called again? Uh, hard, the hard. Company, wow. The company behind it is called is is uh, Hard Original, and uh, it's an energy drink. Yeah, it's it's pretty great. It's really cool. What's what does it taste like? Uh, this one I think is uh, this is just a caffeinated um, sparkling drink. It's got like B vitamins and taurine and all that in it. I think is this it? one, and this one's like a it's a strike hard. So I think this one might be like a punch flavored. Yeah, is it like hints of no mercy or what? Yeah, yeah. Basically, if you drink it, you're gonna start. You know, you're gonna have the best workouts ever, and you know, just gonna be punching walls that you don't like. Yeah. But it's flavorful. That sounds good. So there's I, gonna be I several different. On that when it comes out, especially to all my people in the uh, 
in the food and beverage industry. Robert. I think I, I, I smell another show about that energy drink, guys. Yeah, the pre-sales right now are, are going really well. So, uh, we'll, of course, send you guys some when, when we've got them. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I haven't even tried them yet. <laughs> I love it. So, a lot of things to look forward to. Will that will that drop about the same time that Season 5 comes? It'll be or? in the fall. It'll be in the right fall. around the fall. So many people looking forward to it, including myself and Maddie. It's uh, Season 5. Cobra Kai, I'm sure, uh, quite a few surprises uh, to come. Um any, I should ask you guys this. Anything, any other shows you all enjoy? I mean, I'm sure there's shows you all enjoy watching together. You mentioned westerns. Yeah, any I other mean, shows you all are watching. Offer is one we just finished that we they love. Um, what else was there? I'm I'm enjoying Obi Wan Kenobi show on Disney Plus right yeah. now. It's been really really fun. Um, also, um, what else was there? Well, we watched that movie the other night that, that was unbelievable budget. For an Amazon movie, and it was brilliant. Oh, the Tomorrow War. That was the movie we really liked. Whoa. That was the one with Chris Pratt? Yeah. That was exceptional. Very well done. I mean, really well done. And, you know, last night, uh, yesterday, when we interviewed the stunt coordinator, he worked on... Stranger Things is also something I've been... Stranger Things. Stranger Things is great. You know, there was yesterday watching the guy playing... I can't remember. It was an Australian TV series that he started in as an attorney that was on Netflix. It was brilliant. And um, he plays the father of Elvis. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes in. There was a wonderful show, La, Revol- La Revolution, which was all about the revolution, the reign of terror in France. And a lot of shows come into Netflix that are from Sweden. Great, you know, what is it? The Vi- it was uh, Vikings of Valhalla. That was just terrific because the History Channel opened up the Viking world to us, and I love that culture. But then I realized that when Vikings would just, you know, after they farmed, they would just go out and rape and pillage. And those kind of stories got old quick because well, they were just violence. And But when the Viking stories like um, Valhalla Vikings talks about family and conflict, and all the things going on in a family that go on today went on back in 1100 and, and, and 900 in that period of time. And the Vikings kind of disappeared when they basically, you know, sort of outlived an era in about 1100, 1200. But stories of that area, anything that comes on Netflix and that Valhalla Vikings was brilliant on, on Netflix. And um, it's really good stuff. And I find... We're into period pieces. So yeah. things that really take us and I could learn something about. There's a lot of, you know, revolutionary war shows that are out there. And I I just enjoy them. It takes me away like a cigar, like a good a good, good whiskey, you know, good script. It just takes me away. And that's why I got a ranch. I'm not interested in, unfortunately, being contemporary. I'll either be futuristic warrior who comes back from the past into the future, or I'll stay back there in 1883. You know, it's just my period. You know, that's yeah, oh, that's perfect. And I should probably ask because the uh, you've watched a little Stranger Things since Stranger Things uh, season four, volume two is dropping or just has dropped this week. If you all together were going to take on the Demogorgon, is there a karate move you would use? Uh, I think one he'd probably sweep the demogorgon's leg very quickly I, yeah uh and then he would do he would strike first into the face with a with fire around his fist yeah. uh, I, I would think that oh, would do it i am so happy that it wasn't me who had to mention sweep the leg first oh yeah because I, I was i was just sitting on it literally ready yeah. ready to pounce it we feel like we may hear that at some point like an hour in and there's no sweep the leg i'm starting to sweat and stuff i'm like come on gotta 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 work it in there one way I mean, good. how good. amazing is that? 35 years later, that's part of American yeah. pop culture we still use today. It, it's it's amazing. And people say it to walk wherever I go. I'll, I'll go into the a bit, uh, a, a security office. And I'll never forget this one. I have to hit a button, say who you are, driving into the lower um, parking lot. And the guy can see you on the camera. <laughs> he sees you on the camera and he'll let you in. And... A place I'd never been before. So I press the button, and all of a sudden I hear, I said, I said it's Martin Cove. I said it's Marty, and he said, "No mercy." 
he goes in, you know, and I'd never been there before. And the guy goes, no mercy. And it lets me in. I could have been a terrorist with fucking 50 caliber machine guns mounted in my car. <laughs> because, because it's that dialogue that just is, is what it is. You know, it's just... Um, I can't be, begin to tell you how many times I've I've overused that, and, and you know, at a live fight and everything else, you know, they're in the corner. I'm like, sweep the leg. They just look back over me and like, dude, you got you got to stop. And they're like, sweep the leg. Like, yeah. Well, well Maddie, right, I did I didn't know if it would be you or me that had to ask this. Or we I see several people commenting below, but because we all take on our demons and our demigorgons. All the viewers of Cigar Saturday, we all do. We all need a little advice and encouragement from Sensei. Can you just tell us one time what we need to do? When we get a little down on ourselves, emotionally, you have to remember that I, one thing that kept me going as an actor is whenever I didn't get a part, it was their mistake. And I always thought that from the get-go. And I knock on wood, I've never had to take, in, take another job to subsidize myself since 1970. And I'm in the business 50 years. And it's, I always believe that and I always instill that into Jesse's head, you know? And um, tenacity is what kept John Kreese going. And when Terry dropped out and paid the rent, and I just kept Cobra Kai going. It was tenacity. And why did he remove Billy from Cobra Kai and say, it's my dojo now? Because you violated the values. You got soft and violated the values of Cobra Kai. Mercy is for the weak. And that, that works for me. I don't use it vindictively, but it still holds up. And I've learned that from... Robert came in his writing that keep that sensitivity going, but remember in the back, it's their mistake. If something doesn't work out, I can correct it and I'll be better next time. And it's all about self growth, self belief, self confidence, and fuck them. <laughs> if they're bad. If they're hey, bad. I love that philosophy. Look, look. Cheers. I love it. Yes, Sensei. All right. <laughs> Guys, thank you. It, it, it means a lot to have you all. Uh, Jesse Cove, Martin Cove, both doing some amazing projects and more projects to come, it sounds like, from you both. You're working on them. I want to just mention it one more time. The podcast to go Kicking to is Kicking, Kicking It With The Coves. Coves. You love it. It's really family and it's articulate. And if you lock in if no one's ever watched it the first put on the writers the creators i think the episode's called the creators of cobra kai and they reveal exciting things about the show that if you didn't know it's great to hear because you're hearing it from the mouth of the people that secured ralph macchio william zabka and myself and created this phenomenon that's going into season five on september 9th can't wait. Congratulations to you both, and and uh, th thanks for, thanks for all you've done to bring this back to be here with us. Um, thanks for being on Cigar Saturday with Maddie and I. Thank you, Bourbon Blog. Much love, guys. Much appreciate. Good smoking, boys.